Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Good Ship Mayflower. Happy New Year to all of you. Together, we're going to sail this ship where we think we are called to sail it and maybe into some rough water, and we could not do this without all of you. So bless you, church, for believing that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. our heads together. Holy One, the new year is here and with it all kinds of resolutions to eat less, drink less, except water. You can't drink too much water. To be more patient, more forgiving, less judgmental, less self-centered, and to keep our cell phones charged or to throw them in the river. All good and yet strangely resolutions to make a better you are still focused on you. Here's an alternative, Holy One, a truly radical resolution for 2019. Be it resolved that we, the American people, will trust in the resilience of our democracy and in the decency of the vast majority of our people. We are knee deep in outrage for good reason. Much of what we hold dear is under attack and now is no time to retreat into apathy or resignation. But our resolution for 2019 can be simple and powerful, Lord. We will not turn loose of hope because hope is the last best hope. Hope is not passive, not naive, nor is hope content to complain that the world is going to hell in a handbasket while we buy stock in handbaskets. Hope is gnarly and tenacious and focused on the other. Hope is a deep, quiet confidence that, that when we are confronted with evil, we will recognize it, reject it, impeach it, and then throw open the curtains to welcome the morning sun of a new tomorrow. Hope sees all the color in the most diverse freshman class ever to enter the halls of Congress. Because hope is not black and white. Hope is not gender binary. Hope is not all male. Hope has a sense of humor. Hope is not afraid of women. Hope is the sight of all those children bouncing around in the people's house, not giving up on we the people. This we pray in the name of those tenured professors we call the wise men who knew what to do when standing next to the brown baby of those on the run at the border between hope and despair. Give a gift, the most precious of which is hope. Amen. The scripture lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew, the second chapter verses 1 to 12, under the heading, The Visit of the Wise Men. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. 
When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Here ends this reading inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Today begins the season of Epiphany, one of our lesser known liturgical seasons, even lesser known than Advent. Epiphany, like Advent, lasts a while this year. It is seven Sundays long. Epiphany means revelation. Tradition holds that Epiphany is the revelation of God's coming to be with us. So for the next several weeks, the Gospel readings are all remarkable stories of baptism, healings, and miracles. And we'll need these stories when Epiphany turns into Lent, a decidedly less happy church season. This is the liturgical journey of the church. If you're feeling a little lost when it comes to these liturgical seasons, it's, it's okay. I do not come from a very liturgical tradition either, about as liturgical as corn on the cob, as Fred Craddock used to say. But I have grown to love the liturgical seasons for the help they can give us in being intentional, how they give us the opportunity to rearrange our days and think more deeply about how we move in the world. Epiphany begins every year with the story of the wise men, and this is meant to disorient us, although we should admit that the story doesn't really bother any of us at all. Nothing seems weird. I mean, we've heard it too many times. The whole thing is meant to disturb us, but we're sort of numb to it. However, the details of this story should raise important questions for us, So just a few notes about what makes this narrative an odd story, at the very least. For instance, the the dudes who bring the gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the baby Jesus. The we three kings of Orient are, right? Not exactly. I mean, how many of them there were is never mentioned. We assume that there were three of them because there are three gifts, one for each wise man, And we've turned them into king-like figures, but at the time, wise men from the East would have been under suspicion for being foreigners and dabbling in magic. More than that, wise men from the East is a description that indicates they are Gentiles, non-Jews, not exactly the people who should have seen the light first. But they, they do in this story And thus we are presented with the first question in the text. What truth do strangers see that we do not? But even these strangers do not see everything. They assumed they would find the king of the Jews in the big city. So they head first to Jerusalem, the center of Judean culture. He isn't there, of course. Instead, he's in the unlikeliest of places, the small hamlet of Bethlehem, hardly a hub of religious or political power. An honest mistake. Surely the king of the Jews will be born in, or at least close to, a palace? It would have been a safe assumption, too, to think that the one who was promised would be, I don't know, the son, maybe, of someone closely connected to the temple, the center of religion. So, of course, Jerusalem. But not in this story. There... There is another question hidden there. What might we find if we look less to institutions to bring change and instead turn to our neighborhoods? The wise men's mistake in heading first to Jerusalem inadvertently alarms Herod, but even this part of the story should be surprising. They are upfront with Herod about who they are looking for, a child, But instead of laughing off the ridiculous idea that some yet-to-be-identified infant of an oppressed people is an actual threat, the paranoid tyrant begins to plot the murder of every Jewish child under two years of age. His fear will eventually force the Holy Family to flee 
to become refugees, which should make us wonder what pain we cause, what damage is done when we let fear lead. And perhaps the biggest upside down detail of them all is that the king of the Jews does in fact turn out to be a baby. We are not surprised, of course, but can you imagine what the wise men thought? I mean, there had to have been some kernel of doubt that they would find an actual baby. They weren't really sure about the time or the location of the birth anyway, so maybe they had in their minds, mm, they'll find a teenage boy or someone who at least looked coachable or, I mean, somewhere near being able to lead a people. They'd come all this way, had a rather awkward encounter with the real ruler of the day, only to find that the king with whom God identifies is not training an army for revolution, but is still in diapers and needs a nap time. This can't be right. But in this story, it is. Somehow, the wise men recognize hope when they see it. Would we? That, that's the next question. Do we see hope when it doesn't look like what we think it will? We know the rest of the story. The wise men, having found the child, know that no good can come from reporting back to Herod. So they leave their gifts and their joy with Mary and the baby, but they take with them the hope they found and go home by another way. Nothing in this story is as it should be. No one seems to be in their proper place or playing the right role. The story is disorienting. But this is what is so necessary about Epiphany. At the close of one calendar year and the opening of a new one, it gives us a chance to assess who we are and our place in the world. It is a spiritual practice, and more than ever, the world is in need of Christians who insist on it. Just as in the story, lives are at stake. We are in the middle of withdrawing American troops from Syria. Some have celebrated the president's surprise announcement a few weeks ago as long overdue. It's not too soon, but rather not soon enough. Others insist that our presence there is required, needed, even that it is America's role to police the Middle East. What New York Times correspondent Mark Landler has rightly pointed out is that the president's abrupt move short-circuited a national debate about the future of America's wars. Since the announcement, there have been some developments, some walking back, some pressing forward, and, and last Friday, the statement that the State Department has no timeline for the withdrawal of American troops from Syria, but does not plan to stay indefinitely. Yet still, there is no discussion of the larger problem that America has as big a milita military footprint as ever in the world, with what seems like little in the way of strategy or approach. Our abdication of this responsibility, of this conversation, has complicated our current situation, where we must figure out how to withdraw while also safeguarding those who have been pushing back against not only ISIS, but the Syrian regime. Then we must resolve to stop doing things that make for war. This is the conversation America must have, and surely the church has something to say about it. This will be a huge cultural shift. The United States has been at war over 90% of its history, 226 out of 243 years since 1776. We've got to come up with strategies other than bombs and boots on the ground. For as the saying goes, insanity is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting different results. We must insist, church, in big ways and small, on having that conversation. We must insist. But this is not to say we adopt the approach of the religious right, who even in their last gasps as the loudest voice in white Christian America, are set on establishing a patriarchal Caucasian theocracy as they keep a white knuckle grip on a closed Bible, 
one they wouldn't dare open lest the gospel slip out and indict them. <laughs> the end game of that strategy is not a world closer to God's vision of just and loving, but rather absolute power. For as white evangelicals were warned by then-candidate Trump himself, if we don't win this election, you'll never see another Republican, and you'll have a whole different church structure. Michelle Bachman followed up that warning with another alarm bell about who to vote for in the general election and why. If you look at the numbers, she said, this is the last election when we even have the chance to vote for somebody who will stand up for godly moral principles. We now know that even if we had asked her to define godly moral principles, it wouldn't have mattered. Fear turns principles into slippery little suckers. Fear is a powerful thing, so powerful it can cause an entire group of people to change their value system or maybe reveal their true character. In 2011, only 30% of white evangelicals agreed that a political leader who committed an immoral act in their private life could nonetheless behave ethically in public life. By 2016, 72% of white evangelicals agreed with the statement. In a head-spinning reversal, white evangelicals went from being the least likely to the most likely group to agree that a candidate's personal immorality has no bearing on their performance in public office. When the goal is just to be in charge, the gospel gets swapped for a partisan agenda. Fear of no longer being the majority makes the gospel terribly inconvenient. But progressive Christians are at risk of this same addiction to absolute power. There is a move to establish the religious left, to act as if liberal Christians are somehow immune to the sins all humans are up against, ego, nativism, and fear. Even now, the temptation to make an idol out of the next presidential nominee growls at the door. We must remember that the title of Messiah has already been taken. If the goal is to merely be in charge, then we will ignore the life and teachings of Jesus completely. There will be no talk of peace through justice, no commitment to the common good, or preferential treatment of the poor. If the goal is merely to be in control, we will not pay attention to the details of scripture, of hope and change nestled in the neighborhood instead of institutions, of wise men who answered an unjust edict with civil disobedience, of a family who fled violence and persecution and looked for refuge in a foreign land, of a child who grew up to offer a master class in resistance to empire by turning the other cheek, loving one's neighbor, and praying for one's enemies. Our work is not to form teams, but to ask where the gospel is leading. In the work of shaping our neighborhoods, our cities, and our nation, we must ask questions that arise from our sacred stories. Who has the power? How is it used? Who benefits? The beloved community must ask these questions and insist on building systems and institutions that center on justice, fairness, and mercy. To do otherwise is to leave the world in the hands of the Herods of our time. We know from stories out of scripture, Syria, and Tornillo that abandoning the work is never in the best interest of our children. We have, we have a built-in opportunity with Epiphany to ask ourselves hard questions, to refuse to let fear lead, and know that hope can be found in the unlikeliest of places. Perhaps then, like the wise men, we will go home by another way. <laughs>